Hi everybody, this is week 12, and as you know from looking at the text and looking at the syllabus, this is the topic, Labor Management Relations, which is um, chapter 11 of the text, which I ask you to read. And I also give you some other supplemental readings to look at, and I will refer to those a bit in this lecture. There's also about three topics that I don't cover in the lecture, but I, I think are important. Uh, which have to do with uh, the the ideas of grievances between labor and management. So uh, impasses, mediation, strikes. I have about three slides that talk to those. At the end of this presentation, I am not going to add any of my own narration to that, but I include them there because they're good um, they're good things to summarize and think about. So certainly don't forget about those as you read. But that's really not what I wanted to emphasize in this lecture. So let me get right into the lecture and we will uh, talk about some areas that I think are really important in terms of labor management relations and in the theme of where we are going strategically, I, I think as a public sector, as a nonprofit sector, and as a private sector, where we're going in our economy and where we think we're going to go. And that's really the theme of the discussion question, which I'm gonna ask you for this week. Okay, so it's interesting to me as a person who is, is really interested in the foundation of where we got our policy ideas and the institutions that really are built to support those policy ideas. It's interesting to me that so much of of labor relations law really is right around the time of the the New Deal and World War II and its immediate aftermath. And so, you know, if you took eighty fifty, which you you did, um, you know that. During about 1948, Dwight Waldo wrote this book called The Administrative State. And really what he was saying was that uh, the future, post-World War II future, was was to be had within this administrative state. And, and really what he meant by that was that uh, we were normalizing the idea that um, we had large administrations that really were institutionalized to run a lot of the policy in that post-war nation. And really business, business really was one of those institutions. And that's, that's something that people forget about when we talk about the administrative state. The post-World War II era really was an era of um, institutionalizing uh, the the administration of of the important elements of our economy. So, uh, I ha some of my research really involves the military. And um, in 1948, there was a, a little known uh, little known outside of the military and Congress committee called the Hook the Hook Commission, which actually established the modern military pay system in a sense and one of the things they said about the military in the Hook Commission, and the Hook Commission was a group of, of industrial businessmen. They were, they were businessmen who were actually in charge of large corporations. But one of the things that they said about the military was that the quote was, the military is a democratic institution in a, de in a democratic society. So what were they, they were saying was that post-World War II America was becoming this kind of business and industrial and governmental giant uh, in a sense and all these institutions were important for the furthering of of kind of the american project as america gained uh, its footing as this superpower post-world war ii and so a lot of the labor law that we see is around this era so the National Labor Relations Act of 1935 really was rooted in the New Deal and in the Depression. So it was this idea that that private sector employees could actually organize for the purpose of collective bargaining. 
And so that established this thing called the National Labor Relations Board, which acted to arbitrate between unions and industries and businesses when need be. And then there was the Labor Management uh, Relations Act of 1947, which articulated unfair labor practices. Um, and the Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act of 1959, um, which kind of established this idea that that uh, unions and management both have rights and kind of establish a structure, an institutional structure for the idea of strikes. Um, and then the Labor Management Relax, uh, Relations Act of 1947, as amended, um, consolidates three laws. And this has to do with the private sector. Um, federal and state governments were excluded and nonprofits were added in the 1970s. So basically, um, the public sector has a, a different set of laws, but in a sense, it all has to do with the idea of collective bargaining. So as I was talking about this idea that um, in this post-war economy, um, both both unions and management were institutionalized in a sense as an essential part of, of really the economic growth of America. It is very true that this all this whole relationship really started to fall apart uh, as the economy became more globalized and there were there were definite pressures on American business but for uh, several decades um, this this bargain between labor and management really stood up and um, and actually benefited both both businesses and uh, labor. But so this idea of collective bargaining really, and this is what the text is referring to, is 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 rooted in the idea that that there's some kind of essential bargain of fairness between labor and management. And so in law we see enshrined this idea that we can enumerate, you know, what constitutes unfair labor practices. And those could be committed really by employers or by unions or by both. And so unfair labor practices really interfere with the right of a worker um, to work. Um, and from the side of unions, it, uh, unfair labor practices and unlawful practices would, would interfere with the employer's management duties and rights. And so we saw very much again, this idea that we could strike this not always happy, I won't say happy bargain, but an agreement that allowed both labor and management to prosper. But there are there are public sector distinctions, right? And so this is really important for us as, as students of public administration to keep in mind. Now one of the main distinctions, and it's in this first bullet, is this idea of government sovereignty. And so um, government government itself has this responsibility to act on behalf of all citizens, not just union members. So really the public interest is larger than the interest of employees of the public sector. Uh, and so we have the idea that the public interest writ large should not be subject to the, the interest of workers. And so the, the idea that public sector employees can organize and can bargain collectively came a little bit more slowly than the idea that private sector, industrial sector and construction sector and other sector employees could organize. This came, you know, in the late 1950s and 1960s when um, workers, public sector workers were basically granted the right to organize. Um, but there are there are ideas that this limited civil service. That's in that last bullet, right? So um, the problem is that organization of public sector workers is seen in some in some quarters as limiting civil service itself. So therefore, um, merit systems and collective bargaining tend to butt heads.
and that has become an issue in a lot of public sector organization of workers. The idea that merit systems in civil service and the unionization of civil service are actually in conflict with each other. And so, of course, we still have, we carry over the idea of employer and management rights, right? Again, this, this is fraught with a little bit of conflict because of the mission of government versus this idea of labor and management um, bargaining collectively. So, um, you know, the mission of a public organization is in fact decided by legislative bodies. So, um, you know, we, we do have uh, theorists and a, a plenty who talk about bureaucracies taking on something of a life of their own. And, and I think there's a lot of research that indicates, in fact, that happens in many cases. However, at its core, the idea is that legislative bodies, Congress, state legislatures, city councils, they set up, they set up the missions of public organizations. So the rules that the USDA must live by, the rules that the EPA must live by, the rules that the Department of Defense must live by are set up by Congress, really. The rules that a a city a school district must live by are generally set up by a state. So those missions are set up by the state. So the managers themselves are really accountable to the legislative bodies that set those up, right? So managers in the bureaucratic sense are accountable to their directors uh, or their secretaries or whoever is in charge of that body. However, the whole body is 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 really answerable to legislative oversight. And so these ideas about, you know, how much can we budget for? How much can we pay labor? Uh, how much money do we have? Those are also set up by the, le the legislative bodies. So the, the, the public sector employees themselves may not always be able to strike the greatest bargain as in the heyday of, for example, the United Auto Workers in the private sector um, because both management and labor are constrained by these legislative bodies. So here's some of the laws and talked about in the chapter that actually um, did talk to collective bargaining in the federal government. Um, and these are three of the big ones. Um, you know, the middle one, the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970 was what set up the Postal Service as kind of in its form now, you know, away from the post office a branch of the of the executive to the U.S. Postal Service, um, which is a quasi-government corporation. So it did grant a lot of collective bargaining rights to postal employees, but it also denied them uh, denied them the right to strike. And so the right to strike in the federal government is generally prohibited. Um, you might recall from history um, uh, a public sector union who represented the air traffic controllers went on strike in the 1980s um, and the president at the time, Ronald Reagan, uh, summar summarily fired all of those employees and, and was successful in doing so because they had violated um, their, the denial of their right to strike. They didn't have a right to strike. Um, and so these acts really affect the relationship between labor and management at the at the public sector. So this slide talks to really the scope of collective bargaining in the federal government sector. Um, so what is negotiable and what isn't negotiable in the federal government sector. So we see this idea that there's mandatory topics, wages and salaries, fringe benefits and working conditions. Well, anecdotally, I will tell you my own story as a federal manager happened to be in the Department of Defense. Um, at base level, we didn't negotiate wages and salaries with our employees. Uh, we didn't negotiate fringe benefits because those were already determined by the wage and grade structure that our workers worked under. So as managers, the main thing that we happen to negotiate with our workers 
were working conditions. Um, that was the area that was most important to our workers because the the wage and salary system was was in place and imposed upon us as managers at the at the local base level and we couldn't change it so we negotiated working conditions um, so you can see that um, that would change the way a negotiation would actually work out there's permissive topics as you see here and often as it turns out as a manager at the federal level one of the things that managers concern themselves with is discipline procedures and grievances um, that happens to be uh, something that's that you would spend a lot of your time on i like the idea of illegal or prohibited topics like negotiation of organizational objectives and how they're implemented or the agency's organizational structure and employment standards oh, why is that interesting to me it's interesting to me because my question is and and i don't really know the answer my question is does that in fact interfere with the idea that we should have a uh, collaborative kind of relationship between labor and management whereby we are able to change or organizational objectives and how they're implemented and whereby we're actually able to make creative and innovative changes to organizational structure you know, given the benefit of the experience of, of the workforce and the experience of managers. So, in fact, that is one of the uh, one of the criticisms of labor unions in general um, from those who are anti-union, which is that it inhibits innovation in the enterprise. So. Of course, the federal government is one thing, state and local governments are another. In fact, as we know, there are far more state and local government employees than there are federal government employees. Um, and this, this varies state to state. So this is an important issue to keep in mind that some states have granted far more rights to uh, organize and engage in collective bargaining than have other states. Um, some states don't have statutes that permit or recognize the right of public employees to even join unions. Some states are highly unionized. Um, and I have a, a really interesting um, map that I included in the materials for this week. It's from Planet Money. It's just a real simple um, presentation Actually, it's a nice looking presentation, but it goes through a timeline of uh, union membership in the 50 United States. Um, and so this is, have you, has evolved, and I'm going to get to that in a few slides. So there are nonprofit sector distinctions, and I think it's safe to say that um, for the most part in nonprofits, um, the workforce probably is not organized um, in the sense of having a union and engaging in collective bargaining. The one exception that I think is probably prominent is the idea that in the healthcare sector, um, many employees are represented by unions, uh, particularly um, nursing unions and other provider unions that might represent people in the healthcare sector. But for the most part, if you think about this, this makes sense that um, nonprofits would be lower on the unionization scale um, because most nonprofits are quite small. Um, and so they really don't meet with jurisdictional standards of the National Labor Relations Board. Um, the idea that um, unions that there should be kind of union to management collective bargaining um, might fly in the face really of a philosophy of nonprofit um, that you know in nonprofit we value these values of openness and dignity and communication between for example board executive director and employees and so many 
people with within nonprofit might actually see this as as an affront to their own professional autonomy, including the people who would nominally be categorized as labor. Um, they may see unionization as something that really is not profitable in terms of the mission. So it's kind of easy to see why unionization is not especially popular in most nonprofits. That doesn't mean that there can't be collective bargaining. Um, there is collective bargaining uh, in nonprofits. And again, I, th I, I would assert that most of that is probably in the healthcare sector. Um, but again, there are so many, um, so many exceptions to bargaining in nonprofit sector. And one of the one of the most important is really is um, church to state relations, right? So um, the National Labor Relations Board has it cannot assert jurisdiction, for example, over church operated schools, over parochial schools, um, because that's ruled as a violation of the First Amendment, which establishes free uh, freedom of religion. Um, so this is this turns out to be um, one of the really important distinctions in the nonprofit sector. So let's get back to this idea of collective bargaining, right? So actually, so the basis of of having a union is collective bargaining. Um, in the in the private sector and in the industrial sector, labor unions were first organized really to represent workers and to give workers a voice vis-a-vis -vis management. So, I mean, the history of unions is that unions really did have to fight hard for recognition and once gained, um, they wanted to hold on to it. So unions, the interest of unions has always been to make sure that the workplace is a union workplace. Now, I'm gonna refer to some data that shows the the influence of unions is declining and i think that's something we we all know um, but the idea is that uh, unions interest has always been in first identifying a union and having the employer recognize that union as its bargaining representative and that that particular union has the right to negotiate and speak on behalf of all employees in whoever's in that bargaining unit and then um, unions must work to demonstrate continued support of the majority of the employees in that bargaining unit. So if, for example, uh, a teacher's contract is negotiated by uh, one of the two major unions that represent um, teachers, the American Federation of Teachers or the National Education Association, that means that that school district has recognized uh, that that particular union as the authority to bargain for the majority of employees in the bargaining unit. So typically in a school district, that would be all K-12 teachers. So that last bullet that says union security, this is a this is a major emphasis of unions. They want to maintain the integrity and security of the union, and they do that through various means. And so this terminology that's in the text comes up. Uh, we have a closed shop, uh, which means, it, you know, it's it it's only closed to um, non-union members. We have a union shop, which means that only the union can negotiate for workers. We have an agency shop. School districts happen to be agency shops. Agency shops mean that whether you're a member of the union or not, the union is is bargaining for you, and in fact, you. While you might not pay union dues, you have typically been required to pay agency dues. Um, so we have these other items which you can read about in the book, which are very important. What I'd like you to do, I put in the little cloud there on the right, is read the Washington Post piece on the Janus case. Um, what we've seen in the last several years is is a slow degradation of from the union perspective, a slow degradation of their ability to represent um, workers. And so the Janus case uh, 
has to do with this idea of an agency shop. Um, what we've also seen from, say, the other perspective is the freedom for people to work without being harassed by a union. So, you know, again, like all things in our public sector, there is there are philosophical differences that sometimes boil over, um, sometimes irrationally boil over, um, and we end up arguing about issues that perhaps we should be talking about. So at this point in the lecture, I kind of want to do a little bit of shift and just talk about this idea of who's in unions and, and who isn't. So I put on this slide, number one, look at the Planet Money historical map presentation. It's a great presentation, which really talks about union membership in general in all sectors of our economy. And, and so the point is that over that several decade time span in that presentation, we see that the percentage by state of union members has declined in almost all cases in some cases radically declined. And so this second data is from the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I give you an article on Canvas to look at. And if you if you go to that link, you should be able to link on the article. At the bottom of the article, there's about six different um, tables that you can look at, which break down uh, union membership in terms of uh, sectors in terms of ages and gender uh, and in terms of industries and in terms of states so you can look at that data uh, and it, it's very enlightening um, it happens to be for 2016 2017 if you're a lot more interested in in how the specifics of union membership has changed over time uh, you can also get that from the bureau of labor statistics but just briefly 2016 and 2017 um, what this is talking about is the number of workers in each of these sectors. Of course, it's all in thousands. And the number both in unions and represented, represented by unions. So this idea of represented by unions has to do with this idea of an agency shop. So education is a great example of that. Um, so the private sector, we see that in 2016 and 2017, overall, and so this includes managers and workers and everyone else overall uh, we see that only a just over six percent six and a half percent of the workforce is represented by unions or, or, or is members of unions with around seven and a half percent represented by unions so that's a very small number from where it's been oh, vastly different than the public sector and this is an important distinction so in the public sector um, in the federal government, we see around 27% in unions and around 30%, 31% actually represented by unions. Those numbers actually increase as, as we change levels. So the percent represented by unions at the state government level goes up to about 33.5% by 2017. And at local governments, it's about 44% represented by unions with around 40 percent of the workers in unions so what is this local government these statistics include the local government of school districts that's really important to keep in mind uh, but it also includes local government workers but but significantly it includes teacher unions So this slide here also comes from um, those Bureau of Labor Statistics slides that I gave you. And I put red boxes around some um, occupations of interest. So you notice on this slide up at the top in the left, it says occupation. So this data, uh, th these data here are actually aggregated on the occupation, not on sector. So this is why I picked out this slide to illustrate a couple of points. So look at the first red box. That I'm talking about the occupation is education, training, and library occupations. So again, this is 2016 and 2017 data. So go over to the third column, um, and you see the percent of employed who are represent who are union members, and then in the fifth column you see percent of employed who are represented by unions. So these are the same um, the same categories I included in the previous slide. So in 2016, um, 
38.2% of education, training, and library occupations were represented by unions. That goes down slightly, um, goes down a percentage point by 2017. 37.2% of, of the persons in education, training, and library occupations are, are represented by unions. Well, uh, what I would assert is that most of those people are probably in K-12 public K-12 education. Go down to the one, the one that says healthcare practitioners and technical occupations. Again, let's go all the way over to the last column. Um, it because it changes a little bit from 2016, but that 13.9% is in 2017. So many of those healthcare practitioners work in nonprofit hospitals, and so that seems to represent an area where nonprofit may have a lot of union representation in healthcare practitioners, and uh, it probably doesn't represent physicians, although it might, but typically it would represent nurses and other healthcare practitioners and technical occupations in that sector. Go down to the third uh, red outline, and it says protective service occupations. Okay, so who is this? This is really, firefighters uh, and police officers. And so at the local government level, this is probably um, it, local government, local government as in cities, this is probably the major union that most cities are dealing with. So, you know, typically in the United States, city dis school districts and city governments are separate entities. Um, it's, there are some cities where the school district uh, is part of the city, some important ones. But um, for the most part, here in the West especially, um, school districts are separate from city government. So the city government itself is typically negotiating, if they have union negotiations, with the public safety unions, the firefighters union, the police officers union, and there's probably another union representing uh, administrative uh, civil servants in city government, but the protective service occupations are the major negotiations that city managers are going to engage in. I threw in the last one, the final one down there, which says construction and extraction occupations. So in the private sector, um, it's still true that in construction, uh, the unions are um, a pretty major force, especially in large commercial construction and in large commercial mining and oil extraction. However, I, what the what data would show you is that in residential construction, um, it is almost completely non-unionized. So the question is, um, and you see in the parentheses there, I say this is where, this is a good place to look at the Edwards article. The Edwards article was published by the Cato Journal. So if you know anything about Cato, you know it's it's a free market. Uh, it has a free market advocacy perspective, and so you would expect an article in there to um, take this perspective. This this is a good article because the author uses um, regression to demonstrate that um, the cost of employment in the public sector is probably higher because of unionization. Uh, and so the author has some interesting connections that he makes in the, art, in the article. So this is a good time to look at this. Um, so the real question is, as a matter of public policy, does this drive up, does unionization this, does unionization drive up the cost of employment for public sector employees? And and is that fair in the overall sense of fairness, given um, that there's a monopoly of power in governments over certain sectors, such as public education and public safety? Because, in fact, um, even though uh, there have been changes in the education sector, the vast majority of students still go to public schools. And um, in most cities, we are not about to outsource um, firefighting and police work. We haven't yet anyway. So uh, the author makes this point that the government has a monopoly in several sectors and is that fair? Uh, 
I'm not providing an answer here, but it's a question. So where are we right now? Um, so what that data tell you is that the, the there are far fewer employees um, in unions right now, right? Why? Well, um, there there are still a considerable number of employees in the public sector in unions. However, economic conditions and kind of changes in the philosophy of how we should provide government services, um, the, you know, privatization, the uh, the idea of new new public management, uh, reinventing government, that we should use more business type solutions for the provision of government services. Um, this requires that unions and employers kind of re-examine this whole relationship and structure, right? Um, so collective bargaining itself um, is a process that obligates union and management to negotiate in good faith. However, a lot of employers really don't like having to recognize a union and a lot and many employees themselves actually don't like being represented by a union. So we kind of maybe find ourselves at an area where there could be some changes. I'm not sure. Um, I talked about this, the privatization of public sectors. So, um, you know, this example I give is this privatization of health care provided to inmates in state prison. That is contractors, right? So that's an example, but there are many, many examples in local government and state government where we privatize the provision of services, right? So this puts even more and more pressure on public sector unions. And does it does it obviate this need for collective bargaining between um, public employees and the employer, the public employer? I don't know if I have the answer to that. Um, but I, but he, but here's a point that's made in in the chapter, and I think it's important. Unions are changing what they're emphasizing in negotiations. Um, it's not just about pay and benefits now. Unions are negotiating and emphasizing things that occur in that last bullet there. Things like affordable and safe daycare, maternal leave benefits, um, increased ability to work flexible hours, um, addressing sexual harassment and discrimination in the workplace, uh, talking about the exploitation of immigrant workers. And so uh, the idea is that the labor movement really has to change its focuses, its focus areas, I should say, um, to reach out to new constituencies and, out, and to address issues that it classically didn't address, right? what the, the labor movement classically addresses in, let's say, 1950s industrial America was pay and benefits and pension plans. That's what that's what unions really negotiated. Um, but now um, unions are finding themselves having to talk about work conditions and improvement of those work conditions. So therefore, this is our discussion question. And, and honestly, it's OK with me, whatever you write. <laughs> um, if you want to take a very anti-union stance, a pro-union stance, um, I, I'm interested in hearing that. And I think your classmates are interested in hearing that. Um, what is your particular view based on what you know and what you've experienced? Um, what's your view of? Uh, of public sector unions and or nonprofit unions in the United States. So I would say this includes unions at all levels of government, notably teachers at what we would call the local level. Um, and will the future that you envision in the workplace encourage or discourage persons from wanting to join uh, public service overall? Um, because I think strategically that's an issue that we will continue to need to address is people joining public service in general. So does the future of public sector unions change that in any sense?
So that's the end of this lecture. Again, in the PowerPoint version of this, you'll see the, the three um, reminder slides of some important issues in unionization. They don't occur on this video, though. So thanks for your attention, and I'm looking forward to this discussion.